Imagine you're driving down a road so familiar that you hardly have to pay attention as you drive. You know this road well and it leads where you plan to go. Without warning, traffic slows and then stops and everyone's diverted onto a new road. This new road is unfamiliar, unfinished, narrower and more treacherous than the roads you're used to navigating. There's no off-ramp, no place to turn around and you realize you have no idea where this new road leads. What do you do? If you can't turn around, you have to figure out a way to move forward. So you slow down, put your energy and attention into navigating this new road safely with no way to know yet if you can still get where you plan to go or what will happen if you run out of gas along the way. There are many moments in our lives when the road we plan to travel is suddenly, unexpectedly unavailable to us. War breaks out. A pandemic strikes. You lose someone you love, experience the sting of rejection or betrayal, struggle with feelings of grief, anger, sadness, shame. For human beings, we know that struggle is an inevitability. It's not a question of whether we will suffer in this lifetime, but when, in what ways, and most importantly, how we will respond in these moments. This is the shadow side of all we love and value in life. We know that love can turn to heartache or grief, hope to disappointment, riches to rags, and life itself inevitably to death. So how do we live our lives, in the words of Dostoevsky, worthy of our sufferings? Our responses to the unexpected turns of life depend very much on the stories we tell ourselves about what these moments mean for us, others, and the world. In the field of psychology, we call these deeply held beliefs cognitive schemas. These are essentially the core beliefs that filter our interpretations of all of our life experiences. So let's say, for example, I hold a cognitive schema that people are fundamentally selfish and untrustworthy. If someone treats me with kindness, I may respond by thinking they must want something from me instead of allowing myself to actually experience that kindness or to see it as evidence against my belief in the selfishness of people. If, on the other hand, I go through life with a belief that people are doing the best they can with what they have, I'm probably going to respond with grace and compassion, even under really difficult circumstances. We know that our beliefs are so important. The stories we tell ourselves and others are so important that they are at the heart of our resilience as a species. So humans share with other animals the primitive instinct to fight, flee, or freeze in the face of perceived threat. Nothing special about that. But it's what comes next that can really set us apart. The cognitive ability of human beings to create and share stories, to make meaning of our experiences, to act based on our values, goals, and perceptions. This is what enables us to pivot, to adapt to ever-changing circumstances. And according to some historians, it's really this unique cognitive ability that's put us at the top of the food chain. It's also worth noting in the current context that this is the cognitive ability that allows us to learn to see differently so that we can do better, even in the face of age-old challenges. As we all face the reality of this pandemic, the combination of uncertainty and potential danger is requiring us to adapt in ways that many of us never imagined we would have to. And the ways in which meeting of these experiences will help to determine the longer term consequences of this time in our lives. So what stories are you telling yourself right now? Are you acting out of beliefs that lead you to feel helpless in the face of these circumstances? Or beliefs that lead you to feel resilient, to act according to your values in the face of these challenges? 
Resilience, broadly defined, is the psychological ability to bounce back in the face of stress or adversity. And because the study of resilience looks at the behaviors and characteristics of people who have lived through chronically stressful circumstances, trauma and all different types of adversity, we know that the raw ingredients that make up resilience are available to all of us, and they don't cost a thing. As a psychologist working with individuals and communities looking to build greater resilience, I have invested a lot of time and energy into the question of what helps people to thrive or to bounce back in the face of unexpected difficult circumstances. And now as a mother, small business owner, and mental health provider living through the relentless stress of a pandemic, I am learning just how intentional I actually have to be to make use of what I've learned along the way. When I'm tired to my bones and uncertain about my next move, I find myself thinking a lot about how those I admire most would respond under these circumstances. This is ultimately why I'm here today, to share with you some of the stories that have given me hope and refilled my own well at the points that I really needed to dig deep to get through this all with my sense of self intact. I recently heard an interview with Esther Perel in which she said, stories are the reservoirs of resilience passed from generation to generation. And this really resonated with me. So on this most recent Mother's Day weekend, I spent hours talking with one of the most resilient people that I've ever known, my grandmother. And I discovered in talking to her that after 96 years of resilient living, the conclusion she's come to in her life align beautifully with the research and expert advice in my field. So this is my grandmother, Janet Williams. She's 96 years old, full of love and life, a true matriarch with plans to live past 100. My grandmother, like most people her age, has lived through a lot. She was nine years old at the height of the Great Depression, 19 when she was forced to drop out of college for the war effort, 20 when her husband of six months was deployed to serve in World War II. The atomic bomb landed on her 21st birthday and she was actually there the night that FDR died. He'd been due for dinner at her father's home in Warm Springs, Georgia and she sat with his security detail as they pondered what would come next for a highly uncertain world still at war. When she was 25 years old, she lost her mother tragically in a car accident. And just six months later, her sister-in-law, who was her closest friend in the world, died of an embolism shortly after giving birth. Three of my grandma's four daughters had been widowed prematurely. She lost her own husband in 2014, and now she's living in a world in which a trip to the grocery store or a hug from a great-grandchild could prove life-threatening to her. The road my grandmother has traveled has been filled with unexpected turns, some of them deeply painful. And yet, she is so clearly still grateful and happy for the life that she has lived. When I spoke with her, it was clear that she believed she's lived not just a good life, but a great life. And I found myself wondering, how was this possible? How is it possible that her story of herself, of her life, became so dominated by the good stuff, even in the face of so much pain and loss. And it's clear that it's because the story of her life that she tells includes so much more than just these stories of suffering. In fact, it sounds more like this. She told me how she was raised by two loving parents whose love, trust, and confidence in her instilled in her from a young age a trust and confidence in herself. How She's had a deep sense of faith and connection to something much larger than herself from a young age. Yes, she lost her mother when she was 25, but her mother had lost her own mother when she was only five. So my grandma told me when she learned of her mother's death, she fell to her knees expecting to cry, but instead found herself thanking God for the gift of having had her mother for 25 years. She took great joy in raising her five children and knows how lucky she is to have been married to the love of her life for 70 years. If you ask my grandmother, she'll also tell you that 
With each loss in her life, she gained deeper clarity about what mattered most, perspective on the preciousness of life itself, gratitude for what she did have in her life. And she will tell you that loving relationships served as a bedrock of hope and support and a reminder of what mattered most during her darkest days. And it turns out she's onto something. Our relationships impact everything from our health to our happiness to our cognitive functioning as we age. We know that good relationships are so critical to our well being that one of the very strongest predictors of resilience for a child in the face of trauma is the presence of a single loving adult in the life of that child. Think about that. One person, just by showing up for a child at the right time, you could be the difference between long-term negative outcomes and resilience for a child you love. It makes perfect sense. Think of what a difference it makes on that unfamiliar road to have friendly company in the seat beside you. When times get hard, we have to turn our energy and attention to what we're living for, not just what we're living through. Prioritizing the things that sustain us helps us to bolster our strength and our courage and to move forward in the face of uncertainty. My grandma also believes that a parent's most important role is raising children who have a clear sense of value and purpose. She's taught everyone in our family, no matter the circumstances, remember who you are and act according to your values. In the absence of a roadmap, our values can serve as a compass of sorts, helping to clarify how forward movement will look and making sure we do not lose track of ourselves as the path becomes uncertain. Some of the most powerful work I've done with clients has been based on this very idea, helping them figure out how to name their most deeply held values and to put one foot in front of the other in service of these values, even when fear accompanies us for the journey. Another lesson in resilience I learned from my grandmother is to hold your dreams close and to look for and create beauty in the world around you in whatever way speaks to you. My grandma had been forced to drop out of college for World War II, but she never let go of the dream of one day becoming a professional. So when she was in her 60s, having finished raising her children, she decided to take up painting. And she finally became a professional, a professional artist, showing her work within galleries in a few years of starting lessons. I am confident that as the person still looking for beauty all around her and reminding all of us to look for beauty in our world, she would be the one making sure none of us miss the beauty of the sunset on this brave new road. Once again, we know from the field of psychology the importance of this sort of initiative, this active stance that she has towards her life and the mindful looking for the good. So the most resilient people have what's called an internal locus of control, essentially a belief that they can impact their destinies by playing an active role in their lives. And the most important actions that we take are those in service of our values. We also know that when we really practice looking for the good, it trains our minds to include these details in the narratives of our lives, to essentially remember the good with the bad. And finally, it helps to remember that even when we can't control the circumstances, we still have the power to respond with intention and to assign meaning to this new reality. Even in the face of grief or trauma, the ways in which we process and respond to our experiences have profound implications for our future well-being. The story we tell ourselves about our ability to navigate this sudden turn may in effect be the difference between driving off the road and becoming better drivers. So I think about this and I'm reminded of a client that said to me, this is really, really hard. And I need to remember that I can do hard things. As we all face this pandemic, adversity, pain, grief, and even trauma are inevitable for many of us. These are not the whole story of this chapter of our shared history. There is also unimaginable beauty, kindness, 
generosity and courage happening in all corners of the world right now. At this very moment, there is a nurse sitting at the bedside of her dying patient, holding a phone up to his ear to give his family the gift of closure. There's a small child hanging a sign in his window to thank the medical workers and other essential workers. A teacher is dropping a meal off to a student whose parents recently lost their jobs. There are communities marching in the streets across America and now across the world, risking their own health and safety to remind us that true peace requires justice for all. There are parents all over the place digging deep to build forts, read books, snuggle scared children, and offer a bubble of security amidst their own fears and grief right now. People being held up and held together by others all over the place, not just in spite of the current circumstances, but in direct response to them. So how about you? How will you continue happening to your life under these circumstances? What does showing up guided by your values look like right now? And what stories can you lean on for hope, for inspiration as you figure out how to navigate the road ahead? As I work to answer these questions in my own life, I am so grateful for my grandmother and the many other teachers like her whose stories serve as our reservoirs of resilience and remind us there is always beauty to be found on the road ahead, as uncertain as that road may be. Thank you.